So, uh, good morning again to um, maybe there are some of you who just joined us and uh, uh, welcome to, to, to you. I hope you enjoyed the worship with us. I hope you um, yeah, feel, can, can really experience that your heart has been consecrated to the Lord and is, is open to receive from the Lord. You're all most welcome. We're very excited to be with you and we're excited to have you here. Um, um, I see uh, a few friends here, um, Becca and Erki and the Sonnenbergs and Becca Brandt and them. And I see my old friend Marcel is on here with us as well. Welcome to all of you and everyone else who's here. So wonderful to have you here. Um, yeah, may, may all of you really be blessed and, and I hope you're really experiencing the presence of the Lord as we are. I want to share with you, we've been sharing the last couple of weeks out of Genesis 1 to 3, just about um, relationship, just about, uh, well, not just relationship, but, but just about our purpose and, and how God has created us for a purpose and, and how that is, that purpose is to be like him, to represent him and to reflect him. And uh, I, I remember once hearing a saying that really stuck with me and that I've really found to be true in my life. Um, the misunderstanding of purpose inevitably leads to abuse. If we misunderstand the purpose of something, we inevitably end up abusing it. If we don't understand the purpose of something, uh, we, we inevitably end up misusing it and uh, doing damage to it. And, and therefore, if we, if we misunderstand our purpose, we'll end up abusing ourselves and abusing one another because we don't understand what it is that we were created for. And... Um, this morning, I want to just uh, continue that and, and speak to us about crea- that, the fact that we are created for, to relate. We're created for relationship. So we, we saw, um, Devald, if you can just go to the next slide, we saw um, that we were created. You can go to the next one. Just draw a little diagram. We were created um, to represent God. Um, so our, the purpose for which we were created was representing God, reflecting his image, um, uh, and, and that includes reforming the world as, you know, sort of working basically and, and taking the, the good creation he has made and, 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 and continue to work in the sense that he did where he reformed um, creation. Um, in other words, he created something out of nothing and then we take, and then in the creation week, he, he took the something he created out of nothing and he reformed it and formed all kinds of things um, out of it as example to us of how to do our work and how to take the good creation that he made and, and to also create all kinds of good things from it. Um, God is the ruler of the heavens and the earth, and he, he said that, that we should rule in his place as his representatives. Also reproducing, he blessed Adam and Eve, he blessed us as humankind and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Um, then also we saw that God rested on the seventh day after he'd finished his work, and we saw that, that we can have the same kind of satisfaction in our work that God had in his when he said, let it be good. And we can also rest, and not only rest from our work, but rest in God's completed work. And um, today we're going to look at relating that, um, that, that we were created to relate, to, to be like God in, in, in relating. Now, um, I'm quite an introvert. I'm actually a serious introvert. Um, some, uh, uh, you, you know what the difference is between a serious introvert and just a normal introvert? Uh, a normal introvert is someone who looks at your shoes while they're talking to you. A serious <laughs> introvert is one, someone who looks at their own shoes while, 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 they, while they're talking to you. So um, I, I used to be a serious introvert. I've, praise God, you know, I've, I've learned a few you know, social skills. You know, some of you might even be uh, you know, surprised to hear that I'm, a, um, that I'm an introvert, but um, I am. Uh, fortunately, God at school blessed me with, with really good friends, uh, really generous friends uh, who in, in many ways brought out the best in me. So maybe I, I'm, uh, you know, I didn't come across as, um, you know, maybe I came across as, as more well-adjusted than I actually was. But I, I was, I was a, a really a serious introvert. I was, I was more like academic and I was into maths and science and all that kind of stuff. I really loved that. And, you know, I, I, was, I was really good at maths in the sense that, you know, Anything that was logical, you know, made, made good sense to me. And, and I just couldn't understand people who, could, who didn't understand maths and, and, and who, who, um, who, who struggled with maths because it, to me it was just so obvious and so straightforward and so easy, actually. It just made sense. It was logical and, and all of that. And, um, you know, then as I, as I finished high school and I went to university, I just realized that I left home for the first time. I just realized that um, I, I wasn't 
that great at relationship because, well, partly because of my introversion and all kinds of other things, you know, just the way I was, I was raised and, and, and so on. I wasn't that great at relationship and I, and I didn't actually appreciate relationship or even realize how important relationship was. And, and I just felt like I didn't have handles on relationship. Like it was, it didn't make sense to me. And, and, I, and I realized that I felt about relationship like many other people probably felt about maths. Um, and I had to gradually admit as a serious introvert that relationship is really important, that relationship is critical, not only relationship with God, but relationship with the people around me. And, and God took me on a journey of, of discovery and, and of learning how important relationship is and how to actually do relationship. And, you know, praise God, you know, today I'm, I'm slightly better at, at it. You know, I'm still not great at it, but I'm definitely better at it than I used to be. You know, I'm, I have a wife who's stuck with me for almost uh, 20 years. And uh, <laughs> it's getting better, definitely better and better. Like a good one. <laughs> she teaches me every day, you know, <laughs> she helps me. So today I'm just going to talk to you about relationship. But, but in that context, obviously, I'm not talking out of, out of the context of someone who's like amazing at relationship. I'm talking out of the context and out of the background of someone who is very much learning about relationship. Um, and some of the scriptures I've learned from the most are the scriptures at the beginning of Genesis. So I just want to read us, uh, um, and Diabot, maybe you can put that on the screen, Genesis 2 from verse 18. Uh, I'm reading from the NIV. And um, a, a beautiful scripture, very powerful scripture. I won't be able to bring out everything in the scripture this morning. I don't have enough time. But I hope to, to just lift out a few very powerful fundamental concepts about us and about relationship about our purpose now we were created from these scriptures. So it says in Genesis 2 uh, from verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for a man, uh, for man to, for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground, all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever he, the man called each living creature, that, was its name. And then verse 20 goes on and it says, so the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But, Ad, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took, God took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. And Lord, we just thank you for your word and we pray, Lord, that Holy Spirit, through your word, you will speak to us this morning. Lord, you are the one that makes the word alive to our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that you'll not only make it alive to our hearts, but encourage our hearts uh, with this word in Jesus' name. Okay, so, um, yeah, I just want to, uh, four things that I just quickly want to highlight from this, this text. Number one. Uh, this text shows us that relationship is important, why relationship is important, what relationship is important, and how we can have this important uh, relationship. So, so the first thing, um, let me just maybe mention this before I start. Um, some of you might um, be visiting us, uh, and, and maybe you sort of still making up, you, you, you may be visiting because you sensed in your heart that you, you sort of a need for God and need for community, and you're still making it up your mind about whether you can trust the Bible or not. And I just want to hold this before you from the scripture. God, it says, created male and female. And <clears throat> if, you, if you look at it now, I, I studied um, engineering when I was at university, specifically chemical engineering. So I'm, I'm very interested in scientific stuff. So I've looked at all kinds of stuff like, um, you know, evolution and so on as well. And, and if you want to look at evolution, you have to look at something and, and, and see it. If you want to see if it's possible, you have to break it down in, stepwise um, incremental uh, improvements that can 
that lead to, to sort of an improvement for, for whatever the, the organism is that supposedly evolves. So if, you, if there is male and female then, then you, uh, and evolution were true, then you should be able to break down that process that formed male and female into incremental steps. Each step should then make, give, a, give sort of a competitive advantage. But if you look at it, and, and I'm not going to do this myself, but if you think about it for yourself, you'll, you'll realize that you cannot actually, through incremental steps, create male and female. You cannot create gender. That's one of the big problems that, that make it very unlikely that, that um, something like evolution could have taken place. And, and that actually shows us that, that not only is this a nice little story that we're reading, but, but we can actually trust this as, as history that God created us and created us male and female. Um, male and female um, was created by God, and we can trust this story, and therefore we can learn from it. So the first thing, this, this text shows us that relationship is important. So, so it says in verse 18, <clears throat> the Lord God said, it is not good that man for man to be alone. If you can just go, um, Devil, to, to, the, to the second to last slide. Um, this is said, um, God says it is not good for the man to be alone. And he says this in the context of having said a few times that creation is good. Every time he created something, it says he looked at it and he said, it is good. Uh, so God created creation good. And then after the sixth day in, in Genesis uh, 1 verse 31, God, if you just, just go to the next slide, Devil. Uh, next one. Just go to the next slide. There we go. And God saw that it was good. So a few times in Genesis 1, he created something. He looked at it and he said, it's good. And in, in verse 31, after he created uh, humans, he looked at it and said, it was very good. And then in the context of this, everything that's good, good, and very good, he says, it's not good that man should be alive. Now, we, we need to let this really impact us and really hit us. God says, in light of everything that was good, before the fall, before any sin, any death, any sickness, any disease, anything bad entered creation, when, when, when Adam and Eve were in the, when Adam was actually in the Garden of Eden, the perfect environment, I mean, everything was great, everything was perfect. I mean, the best export quality fruit that, 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 that you can imagine, you know, fruit better than we can ever see, you know, than, than, than we can buy, pick and pay or checkers, you know, beautiful. Um, no sickness, no disease. I mean, just genetically, you know, they, they would have been um, much stronger than us. They, they would have been, wouldn't have been sort of the entropy and the genetic de degradation that, that we've experienced. Uh, there would have been any disease, nothing like that. And Adam, and Adam had a, a perfect relationship with God. There was no sin. There was nothing blocking his relationship with God or inhibiting his relationship with God. In the context of all of that, that was perfect. God looks at the situation and says, even though everything is very good, it is not good that the man should be alone. In other words, even if everything in our environment were perfect, if we did not, even if we had perfect relationship with God, if we did not have other human beings to have relationship with, it would be not good according to God himself. That is how important relationship is. And not, not only relationship with God, but relationship with one another. And that's what we need to see here. We need to see how important relationship is, how important God says relationship is. And I think during lockdown, we've all experienced that. You know, even guys who, like me who are introverts are starting to sort of get, you know, a, 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 have been getting sort of a bit itchy and, and like, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm over lockdown now. I want to see people. I need to see people. Um, all of us have started experiencing that. We, 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 you know, some of us have even broken the lockdown regulations and started visiting friends and, and all kinds of stuff just because we, we really need relationship and we register that need for relationship. And, you know, I've never, you know, as, as a pastor, you know, I've, I've, I've seen quite a few people. I've done a few funeral or memorial services and, and, and prayed with a few people, you know, towards the end of their lives. And I've never... Um, seen anyone or heard even of anyone on their deathbed who have said that their relationships are too good, you know, or, or they, they've spent too much time in a relationship or they wish they'd spend more time at the office or they, they wish they'd spend more time on other things. Almost everyone at the end of their lives say, 
I, I want the people I love close to me. I, I wish I had better relationships with the people around me. In fact, I was, I was reading on the internet just sort of an overview of, you know, an article of a lady who works in a hospice. And, and obviously, she, she, every day she deals with people who are um, sort of nearing the end of their lives. You only have a couple of weeks left. And she said the things that are mentioned most that people regret at the end of their lives are almost, well, most of them have to do with relationship. Most of them are, are to do with, um, I didn't have enough time in my relationships. I, I neg neg neglected relationships in favor of all kinds of other things. Um, uh, now, remember, we said that work is important. So we're not saying work is not important, that you should not spend time on work. But, you know, if, if we also said that if work becomes all important, it's a problem. Um, people who said, um, I regret not fixing, you know, sort of a, a relationship that got broken, maybe a family feud or a relationship with a friend who meant a lot to me that where things went wrong and I didn't go and fix it. Or, or just, um, I regret um, not being more myself in relationship and, and really allowing people to experience who I was. I regret, in a sense, putting my best foot forward or being ashamed of who I was and not being able to share with people who I really am and not allowing people to really get to know the real me, all kinds of stuff like that. Those are the things that people regret. And many of them have to do with relationship. So our experience shows us that what God says in this text is important. It's not good for us to be alone in, and relationship is critical to us. Now, why is relationship so important to us? The second question. And, and, and this text also tells us in Genesis 2 verse um, 18, actually this text hints at it. It says, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone, for the man to be alone. Uh, so it says the Lord God. And the interesting thing there is, and, and allow me, you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn a bit of Hebrew now. And uh, Hebrew is a very interesting language. And I love sort of digging into the, 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 the text. So, so many of you, um, you know, know what, um, you know, sort of the background of this is. When it says the Lord God, the word God there is in the plural, Elohim, uh, which is the plural of El. So it's, it's God, plural, and then it says said, and, and, and Hebrew verbs like Greek verbs and, um, and, and even English verbs to some, some other extent, the, the number of the verb matches the number of the subject. Um, in other words, where he's performing that verb. So, so yet God, plural, is saying something, but the, the verb said is in the singular. So, so, so God is both plural, but he acts as the singular. So he's, he's both Many and is one. Uh, and, and we know from the New Testament perspective that is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is why relationship is so important, because God is a relational God, because God is three in one, because God is a divine family, as it were. Uh, we see that confirmed in Genesis 1, verse, verse 26 and 27, and it says more explicitly, then God, once again, Elohim, plural, said, once again, singular, let us make, so us, Plural pronoun, make, singular verb, man in our image. Um, and then he says in verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And, and, and the reason why relationship is important is because relationship is one of the most important ways in which we reflect a God who is a God of relationship. We cannot reflect God without relationship. We cannot represent God without relationship. And so often in, in human history, we as humans have tried to separate ourselves so that we can better represent God. Just think of all the people who went into the, the desert, you know, to go and be on this by themselves, go and be, live as hermits. Or people who went into monasteries uh, and tried to separate themselves from the world. But what this text shows us is that we cannot actually represent God and become more like God unless we do it in relationship because God is a relational God. God is inherently and fundamentally relational. And, and we see that even more clearly when we, when we um, compare and contrast the, the biblical view, the Christian view of God with other views of God. If you think about Eastern views of God, where there are many gods, but, but where it's, it's mostly sort of where they're mostly impersonal. Um, I think many of the Eastern gods, um, many, many people who believe in Eastern religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, and so on, um, like Hinduism, which actually has many gods, have started seeing those gods as more personal. But that's not because Orthodox um, Hinduism believes in personal gods. That's, that's more as a, because of the influence of Christianity, which, which revealed a personal God 
to 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 people and and hinduism is is inherently syncretistic so it takes aspects of other religions and incorporate it into into hinduism so i think that's why many hindus today would actually say they believe in personal gods but but inherently most eastern religions are impersonal uh you know they, they are gods with whom you cannot have relationship they're more forces than than real persons and then you have unipersonal you have impersonal many gods or you have unipersonal gods like in islam or judaism now for instance like in islam if if allah existed for eternity past with no one else with him then he didn't have he couldn't have relationship with with anyone else he couldn't love anyone else and therefore love and relationship cannot be inherent to whom to who allah is and therefore it's not surprising that the quran never says that allah loves his followers because relationship is not fundamental to who he is whereas if you contrast those two impersonal gods and unipersonal gods with the bible that talks about a um a tripersonal god who is tripersonal but one god you know it's a divine family who from eternity past has always had relationship with himself with the three persons of the trinity then you have to say that relationship is fundamental and inherent to who god is and god is love whereas you can say god yahweh the god of the bible is love you cannot say that the impersonal gods of the east or the unipersonal gods like allah are love so that is why relationship is so important is so important because relationship is fundamental to whom god is and and through relationship we represent a god who is love and who is relational um then sorry let me just get my notes here <laughs> then um what kind of relationship is important um it says in verse 24 uh Genesis 2 verse 24 uh, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh and and here it um, it talks about marriage uh, we see the, the the word marriage is not used there but we see marriage being portrayed there the very first marriage um and and it says uh, there's a there's a leaving there's a weaving together and then there's a cleaving that happens in in marriage um where where husband and wife are knit together in covenantal relationship now as marriage is held up here for us not only as the first human relationship but as the building block of society and the human relationship out of which all other human relationships flow and as in a sense the prototype of all human relationship and it's it's held up specifically as a covenant relationship in other words relationship should be covenantal not just commercial or convenient Now it's our relationship should not be just um you know relationships where we give and receive where we give and take in other words it should not be just relationships where we always analyzing the cost benefit ratio ratio uh, like we do in a typical commercial relationship you know if i go to my grocer um you know i buy something from the grocer but if i can get it at a better price at a different grocer you know there's no covenant you know that i have with pick and pay or checkers or whoever that says i'm only you know have that grocer relationship with them <laughs> you know or if you if you're a tenant and you you're renting a a room or a or a or a house from someone um you know it's it's not a covenant relationship until death do us part you know it's it's a it's a commercial relationship so there's place for commercial relationships but the problem is in our modern age we've commercialized all relationships even friendships even family relationships like and not just biological family relationships but spiritual family relationships and even marriage has become commercialized and we we our culture almost leads us to commercialize everything and become little consumers who commercialize everything and say what is the cost benefit ratio am i getting more out of this marriage or out of this friendship than i'm putting in if yes then i'm going to stay in it if no then i'm going to withdraw from it and find another relationship in which the cost benefit ratio is more favorable to me and it it our minds have been so distorted from the biblical norm of covenant relationship that we only stay in relationships or we tend to we tend to only stay in relationships 
as long as it's convenient. But this text tells us that we should approach not only our marriages, but our friendships and all our family relationships, including our spiritual family relationships, as covenantal relationships in which we don't only stay in them as long as they're convenient to us and as long as we feel we're getting more out of them than we're putting in. In other words, this text says to us, we should be like God, we should commit to relationship and then press into them, even when they become difficult. And for some of you, um, your relationships, because of the, you know, much of, many of your relationships have to now be sustained over, you know, stuff like Zoom, you know, like we're having now, you know, um, and, and digital fatigue is a real thing. And, and, and it's no longer just convenient. And many of us have therefore started neglecting our relationships. And what this text says to us is, no, don't neglect your relationship. Be covenantal in your relating. Press into those relationships. Even when it's not convenient, we should press into those relationships. Another thing that this text tells us, it says, uh, God says, uh, the Lord God says, I'll make him a helper suitable to him. And what that tells us is that we need relationship, um, a few things. Firstly, we need relationships with with, with, with people who are not exactly the same as us. Okay? Well, let, let me maybe swap it around. First, we need relationship with, with people who are sufficiently the same with us. I mean, we read about how God brought the animals to Adam. And, and the point of that was to show that, no, the animal, animals don't fulfill that need. Okay? Guys, uh, a dog is not man's best friend. <laughs> or a dog maybe. You know, in, in, in those, those cultural terms, a man's best friend. But a dog cannot fulfill this need. <laughs> okay? Because a dog, or a cat for that matter, ladies. <laughs> because a dog or a cat is not sufficiently the same as us. Okay? And that was the point of bringing the animals. So that we can see, no, the animals are not sufficiently the same. But then, um, also, this... Um, Helper, suitable helper must be sufficiently different. Sufficiently the same, but also sufficiently different. And that's why we have male and female. But that's also why we have different characters and different personalities. As human beings, you know, even, you know, two men are different in terms of our characters and our personalities. Two women, you know, who are in a friendship with one another are different in terms of their characters and personalities. So don't just allow, surround yourself with friends. Don't just make friends with people who are exactly the same as you you know, who are exactly the same as you on, in terms of their Myers-Briggs or whatever. You need people who are different from you. I mean, that, just as, as men and women, that's, um, and even as friends, that's what we most appreciate and benefit from one another is the fact that we're different from one another in so many ways. I, I know you ladies, when you go and drink tea, you know, even when you break the lockdown regulations and you go and, go and drink tea together, you know, and you talk about how your husbands, you know, annoy you, you know, one of the main things you talk about is, you know, the fact that he's just different from you and he doesn't do the things the way that you would have done them and you would like them to be done, you know? But also, if we're honest, the things that attract us about one another as husbands and wives are the things that make us different from one another, you know? Ladies, you also say, you know, like, um, you know, he's, yeah, he's, uh, why is he not so emotional, you know? Why is he not so sensitive to our own emotions? You know, you, I mean... And, and, and you know, obviously your girlfriends understand, you know, mm, I get your girlfriend, I know, you know, he doesn't understand, he just doesn't get it, he's not sensitive enough, you know. But also the fact that, that your husband is sometimes, you know, not as given to emotion, you know, when you sort of, ladies, you, you're, you're sort of falling apart emotionally, then, you, then you're glad that your husband is emotionally, you know, not falling apart with you, but, but he's strong and you can cry on his shoulder and he can put his arms around you and say, you know, it's going to be okay and he can comfort you. So, so then you appreciate the difference again. Mm-hmm. You know, and we're like that, all of us. We, we need the sameness, but we also need the difference. Um, then we need someone who's, this text tells us, who is equal to us. Now, some people look at it and it says helper is suitable. And they, they look at the word helper and they say, yeah, but helper, doesn't helper imply someone who's inferior? No, it actually doesn't. You know, that same, same word helper, um, adzer, in the, in the Hebrew, is used for God. God, exactly that same Hebrew word, is used for God, where it says God is Israel's helper. And God is not inferior to Israel. So the word helper does not by any means imply inferior. In fact, it says that Adam, God took Adam out of, um, Eve out of Adam's, one of his ribs, took one of his ribs and made Eve. I mean, that, that, 
that points, that, that shows us in beautiful, beautiful um, descriptive language that actually Adam and Eve are equals. Male and female are equal because was taken, Eve was taken from Adam's side, not from his feet as though she were beneath him, not from his head as though she were above him, um, but from his, from his side showing that she's equal to him from under his arm that shows that he should protect her and from close to his heart to show that he should love her. In other words, she's a helper who is equal to him. She's someone who's equal to him. But she's also someone, the word uh, translated there, suitable, is, is comparable. Well, the, the, the root word means opposite. Someone who is, in a sense, he's opposite, but he's, but he's opposite in a complementary way. In other words, his counterpart, who completes him, who's Who's, who's his counterpart that, that um, you know, like a key in a lock um, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a plug, you know, and a, and, and, and a plug hole or a, or a fiddle and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, the, and the bow that, with which you stroke it. Uh, we complement each other um, as male and female. And in many ways, even in friendships, we complement each other. Our differences complement each other. So um, that is why we, we, need, we need relationship, um, and, and that, that is the kind of relationship uh, that we need. But we also see that Adam and Eve sinned. God said, you know, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They did that. And, and God said, the, the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And it's where it says, the man, Adam and, 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 and his wife Eve were both naked and they felt no shame. After that, they, felt, they, they started experiencing both blame and shame. They, they experienced shame and they started covering themselves with fig leaves and hiding from God, hiding from relationship with God. And we see there's a breakdown in relationship with God because of sin and a breakdown in relationship with one another because they start blaming one another. I mean, Adam says, uh, it's really funny, you know, when God says, Adam, where are you? And, and of course, you know, when an almighty being asks you a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. He wants you to think about the answer. So ask Adam, where are you? You know, and Adam is like, um, here I am, Lord. <laughs> And, 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 and God says, have you eaten of the tree I command you not to eat of? And he says, the, the woman you gave me. And you can just hear the blame in his voice towards God, as though it's God's fault. God, you gave me this woman. She, she, the, the woman you gave me, she gave me of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and I ate. You know? So he's not only blaming God, he's blaming the woman. You know? So we see blaming and shame, blame and shame entering human relationship and breaking down human relationship and even the relationship uh, with God. And how, so how, how can we have then right, this kind of right covenant relationship? Well, in a beautiful way, God prophetically from the beginning of creation made it creation in such a way that Adam and Eve and their creation actually point towards Christ and the church. Remember, Christ was crucified since the foundation of the world. So it's not like Christ and the church reflect the relationship between husband and wife. It's actually the other way around. Husband and wife actually reflect the relationship between Christ and the church because the, the God's ideal for Christ and the church actually came first. And we see it uh, in the sense it says, um, for, uh, that is why a man leaves his father and Jesus became human in the incarnation. He left his father to come and actually get a bride on, on earth. He left his heavenly father to come and get for himself an earthly bride. What he said, God said, the, the day you eat of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And Jesus came and he died for his bride. What his bride was supposed to experience, the, the surely dying, uh, because we, we, uh, we've, since Adam and Eve, we've confirmed the decision and also eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We've said, I'll decide for myself what's good and evil. I'll decide for myself what's right and wrong. And I live according to what I decide is good and evil and right and wrong. I will not trust God in it. So we've confirmed that. So all of us sh should surely die and, and do die um, eventually physically, but certainly from the beginning spiritually. And Jesus came and experienced that. He experienced death on our behalf. The one who was like Adam, who had no sin, was born without sin, and who would have never died. He died for his bride. But not only that, um, God created out of him, just like Eve was taken out of Adam's side. So Jesus on the cross, remember the, the spear was stuck into his eye, side and blood and water flowed. Um, and out of that, the, the, the blood representing his forgiveness, 
um, and his lifeblood and the water representing his spirit who, who, who pours out. And through that, the blood and water that came out of his side, his wife, the church, the bride of Christ, um, us, we were created from, um, from Christ in the same way. And, and therefore, we can now have this covenant relationship. But here's the thing I want you to get. This, this unifying, this giving yourself fully, becoming one flesh, becoming one covenantal unit, sticking it out even when it's difficult, forgiving over and over, loving mercy. You can, uh, we can only, as human beings, we cannot really consistently love like that unless we have been loved like that. It's only if we are in a relationship in which we are loved covenantally, in which we have someone who loves us despite our sins, despite our shortcomings, despite losing our temper, despite becoming frustrated with that person, but despite um, you know, us being selfish, despite us letting that person down, they never let us down. It's only when we've been loved like that by someone else that we can love one another like that in return. In, in other words, it's only when we've been covenantally loved by Jesus as our spiritual and divine spouse that we can love one another covenantally and unconditionally. And, and, and through the cross, we can have that covenantal relationship with Jesus. We become, can become part of his bride. And this is just something I need to highlight. Um, Jesus is not interested in a one-night stand with us. He's not just interested in a friendship of convenience with us. He's not interested in a relationship that'll just last for a season. He's interested in covenant relationship with us. If you're going to be in relationship with Jesus, it's going to be covenant relationship. It's going to be not even till death do us part like marriage. It's going to be forever. Even death will not part you. And he will love you in the way that you need to be loved so that you can love others in that way as well. So let's step into that relationship with Jesus. Let's allow him to love us that way. And let's then love one another as Jesus has loved us. I want to close with this uh, quick story. I'm sorry, I took a bit longer than I, I intended to, you know, thank you for being patient with me. We're going to break up into breakout rooms in a, in a little moment, but I just want to end off with this, with this one story. There was a, a famous um, Afrikaans preacher called Louis Malabra, and he was actually a, a very gregarious, very extroverted um, guy, brilliant uh, insurance salesman. And uh, he was actually married three times and, and eventually got saved and became a, a Christian preacher. But he said, famously said, my first marriage failed because in my first marriage, I was the most important person. And he said, my second marriage also failed because in my second marriage, my wife was the most important person. But then he said, my third marriage succeeded because in my third marriage, Jesus was the most important person. And the only way our relationships with one another, whether it's, whether it's marriage relationships or whether it's friendship relationships or whether it's family relationship, brother and sister in Christ or, or even uh, biologically, can work as they ought to work covenantally is if Jesus is the most important relationship in those, uh, the most important person in those relationships. And therefore, I want to ask you, is Jesus the most important person in your relationships? Is Jesus the most important person in your marriage? Is Jesus the most important person in your friendships? If he is, he will empower you to be able to have that relationship and, and, and live in that relationship and love in that relationship as he loves you in, that, in, in his relationship with you. I just want you to close your eyes for a moment and I'm going to pray for us. Father God, we just want to thank you, Lord, that you created us for relationship. We just confess that we need relationship, but we also just confess that relationship so often because of blame and shame and sin, Lord, relationships so often break down, Lord, our relationship with you and our relationship with one another. But thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can just invite you into not our, only our relationship with you, Lord, personally, but our, all of our relationships, our friendships, our marriage, um, everything, Lord. Our acquaintances, we can thank you that we can just invite you in and say, Jesus, come and be the most important person in those relationships and come and love us the way that we so desperately need to be loved so that we can love one another, Lord, the way that you love us. Please help us, Lord, as your church to not relate as this world relates with 
Lord, commercial relationships that are just relationships of convenience, consumer relationships, but to have counter-cultural relationships, Lord, so that the world can look at us and see that we are your disciples by the way that we love one another mm-hmm. as we reflect your love and your covenant commitment to us as we covenantly love one another in Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you give us the strength and the grace to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening. I hope you've been encouraged. Um, We can have amazing relationships by God's grace and by him being to us everything that we need so that that we don't go, you know, like I almost want to say in a parasitic way to one another to receive all those things from one another because we've already received it from Jesus so we can just go to one another and give. But I just want us to, to break up into... Um, breakout rooms and just discuss a few questions. Um, firstly, um, if you'd like us to pray with you, uh, please decline the breakout room. And, and if you need specific prayer, I mean, obviously you can get prayer in the breakout room as well. But if you, if you really feel um, you need specific prayer and you want me or um, an- another lay counselor or someone to, to just pray with you, then, um, then, then just decline the breakout room um, invitation. It will come onto your screen just now, and then we'll stay behind in the main room, and then after we'll allocate you to a separate prayer room and pray with you. Um, otherwise, you can go. You can just accept the, the breakout room invitation, and um, there's no time limit. You can go into the breakout rooms. Just remember to pick someone um, as the facilitator in the breakout room at the beginning. You can just sort of facilitate the discussion. Then you can discuss um, the questions and actually pray for one another and just encourage one another. Uh, the the questions we have, um, Gerald, if you can just quickly bring up the, the questions. You're welcome to take just a, um, a screenshot maybe of these questions if you'd like with your device. So you can discuss these firstly. How can my life better reflect the importance of relationship? In other words, if I realized again this morning that relationship is crucially important, does my life actually reflect it? Does the amount of time I spend on it? Um, and, and the, the, the priority I give to it, does it reflect the importance? And, and how can, can, can how, the way I spend my time maybe better reflect the importance of relationship? Uh, and how is shame holding me back from relationship? And how can the gospel deal with both blame and shame so that, I can, so that we can relate better to one another? Okay, um, Izan, if you can send us into the breakout rooms. You're welcome, like I said, to stay in the breakout rooms and just to fellowship and care. The Lord bless you. Love you guys. Thanks for watching. Join us again next week. We would also like to thank every essential worker, school teachers, and all those who are working on the front lines. Let us continue to pray for them, for our government and for the people of South Africa during this period. And let us remember to always fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith.